wind, fresh fire. This chapter of Acts was the day of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit, and there were incredible signs. This was the start and the explosion of the church. And even though that was a long scripture, I've got to back up just a little bit more, so bear with me. <laughs> when the Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages, and the Spirit gave them the ability. And now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. That was one through six. At the time, there were Jews from all over, and it lists all the different regions where they had come from. I spared you that. You can certainly <laughs> look that up. But this was an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles, and they began to speak boldly, and they were understood in the many languages of these people from different regions, other, other parts of Israel, and speaking their home language. The outpouring on the apostles had been foretold by Jesus. Through this power, thousands joined the believers, and it marks the formation of the early church as a community of believers. But it started with some confusion. Like Gary said, some were wondering if these apostles were drunk, and others ask, but what does it mean? What does it mean? For the first 11 chapters of the book of Acts, Peter is portrayed as the spokesperson for the disciples. And first he has to debunk the idea that they're not drunk because it's only nine o'clock in the morning and convince them this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Peter is speaking as a Jew to the Jews from all over the region and he addresses them as fellow Israelites. Peter begins by citing the Jewish prophet Joel, which he just read. And then he includes the words of David to describe what they should expect in a Messiah. Peter uses the prophets to explain the identity and truth about Jesus, including his life, his death, and his, re uh, his death at the hands of the Romans, which he calls those outside the law. And then he describes the resurrection. Peter presents the truth along with an accusation, you crucified him. But we also know Peter shared in that guilt because he had denied Christ three times in Luke 22. And just like Peter and those in the crowd, we may ask, how have we or how have I denied Christ in my life? Peter's understanding of forgiveness and restoration of his relationship with Jesus was deeply personal. Peter knew grace because he had been restored three times by Christ in John 21. That grace is also reflected in our Wesleyan theology. And a lot of times we find that theology in our hymns. In Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, which is number 363 in your hymnal, it has a few lines. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free. For, oh, my God, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Peter knew that. That was in his deeply rooted theology because he had been restored. And every sermon we have by the apostles, like this one by Peter, includes the news that Jesus is not dead but raised. Peter boldly declares that God, ex 
exalted Jesus as Lord and Messiah. In verse 36, Peter's description of the life, death, and resurrection leads the crowd in their guilt to ask their next question. In verse 37, the crowd asks, Brothers, what should we do? And then verse 38, Peter gives them the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. At this point, Peter testifies to other things, teaches them about forgiveness, and he tells them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Note, all of this happens at 9 o'clock in the morning, which, if you look back, it was the same time of day that Jesus was crucified. So there's a little repetition there. And guess what? 9 o'clock, here comes the Holy Spirit. So those who welcomed this message were baptized, and that day 3,000 persons were added That day the Holy Spirit moved in the crowd. 3,000 came to believe and were baptized. This explosive growth and birth of the church was a direct result of divine intervention and action by God through the Holy Spirit. So who are we in the story? Acts 1, the church was comprised of the 12 apostles. They had replaced Judas, along with about 120 believers. In this chapter, there's thousands visiting Jerusalem, and now 3,000 join the church. Pastors often uh, preach this chapter like the church is the 3,000. But really, we're the 120 receiving those new believers. We are the followers. Many of you were baptized. You are forgiven. And you have received the Holy Spirit. If you have not been baptized but would like to be, please let me know after this service, and we will get you set up with Pastor Callie and get that taken care of very soon. So what did the 120 followers do with these 3,000 new believers? They sent them out church shopping to find who's got the best coffee mug in Edmond. No, that's not what they did. They devoted themselves. So we get the next answer in verse 42, but there's no question. Instead, we find that answer and we have to figure out what was the question he was answering in his rhetoric. The answer in verse 42, just after that long reading, was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. So the question we might ask today is, What does a successful church look like? Maybe it's great Sunday schools, great music. We have Don, we have Lucas. We certainly have that. Maybe it's a wonderful children's ministry, which we certainly have, including a slide. A building with a new heat and air system. That's pretty important. (laughs) Those who know have been here a while. (laughs) Maybe it's pickleball, and that's part of fellowship. Steve, our facilities manager, invited me to come play with him, but I think he just wants somebody to beat. So (laughs) maybe you're looking for the best congregation, definitely the best-looking congregation in town today. Or maybe we need to find a better question. Maybe the question for verse 42, what is an authentic church to be? We know it means being devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. This verse highlights the close-knit and supportive community that the early Christians formed. They were dedicated to learning and following the teachings of the apostles, who were the closest witnesses, followers of Jesus during his lifetime and through his death and resurrection. The word used in scripture is didac, which was an anonymous first century document of the apostles' teaching. And that was before there was the canon that we find for our New Testament. New Covenant is a church that believes the apostles' teachings, and we believe traditional views of Scripture as our authority 
and as our guide for faith. That view is not held across our denomination. And that's why we're having our family meetings. So I encourage you to attend those. As for the new covenant, we believe Peter. We believe that Jesus lived on earth. He died a painful death. He was raised by God. He ascended into heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit. And he did all of that for our forgiveness. This we believe. The early church also participated in fellowship, which likely included sharing of meals and other forms of social interaction. They were united in their beliefs and practices. They supported one another in spiritual growth. They also had a sense of shared purpose and mission. They sought, as they sought to spread the message of Jesus to others, they worked to build strong, supportive relationships with one another. Some people have idealized the part in the text at verse 44 where they held all things in common, but that was not the long-term economic model of the church, and it really indicated that there was generosity in making sure all the needs of the people in the community were met. They also participated in communion and prayer as a way to strengthen their faith and connect with God. The breaking of bread is a reference to Christian communion in which bread and wine are shared as symbols of the body and blood of Jesus. This was a sacrament instituted by Jesus with his disciples. At New Covenant, we celebrate communion on the first Sunday of each month, and it is available for you to take every Sunday on your own at the table over here to my left, this north wall. And lastly, the verse notes, they devoted themselves to the prayers, plural, which likely indicated the Lord's Prayer, the Psalms, and other known prayers of the early church. There were many ways to praise, to pray, but it takes daily practice to be devoted to that. Now, I have to admit, <laughs> I'm married to someone who's much better at being devotion, at devotion to prayer. <laughs> and the most meaningful change I made in my prayer life was when I stopped telling people, I'll pray for you later. And instead, I offer, I'll pray with you right now. Now, I do keep a list uh, on a post-it note by my desk for those other prayers, but I found it best to pray immediately. I don't care if it's in a Walmart parking lot or a crowded restaurant. If you need Jesus there, he will show up. And the person you're praying with will remember it. In short, Acts 42 describes the early Christian community's devotion to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayer. This verse highlights the importance of community and devotion in the Christian life and serves as an inspiration for many modern Christian communities to strive to emulate the example set by the early Christians. This was a place where people's deepest human longings were met the longing for God, for community, and basic provision. And they were all met in abundance by each other. So our call to action in this scripture is to be the church Peter would want us to be. We are to be a people like the church in Acts 2. We're to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, I have things to hold up at this point, so I'll try to juggle all of this. New Covenant has a reading plan for this year. And lucky for you, it's not too late to start. We're only in the second chapter of Acts. So we actually started with the book of Acts. We're two chapters in. You can catch up or you can just join us right where we're at. We're moving very slowly and deliberately through these as we prayerfully consider our future. Like Jay says, uh, it, it is slow and deliberate on purpose. So um, pick, pick up a card on the table on your way out and join us. We are devoted to fellowship. In the highest sense of the word, this meant mutual interests, communion, and close relationships. While New Covenant does offer many fun activities like pickleball that I mentioned, we're also encouraging people to join in D groups. So D groups were a practice started by John Wesley, and he called them band groups. We call them D groups or discipleship groups. It's a small group, men with men, ladies with ladies, 
doing life together, meeting on a regular basis, praying for each other, and developing our spiritual walk. So there are materials available. There's an app that goes with it. If you're interested, reach out to Pastor Callie, and she'll help you find a group. And then our response today in service is found in the latter two, the breaking of bread and prayer. We offer communion already consecrated at the small table over here. We had a community prayer earlier, but if you need specific prayer, we would be honored to anoint you and pray with you personally after, after the service or during the music. And also be praying the 40 days of prayer according to our guide. Overall, this was an amazing day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God used incredible power of the Holy Spirit to embolden the apostles and bring his people together and move them towards him and form a church. So what does it mean? It means that Jesus did live on earth. He died, was raised, ascended, and then sent the Holy Spirit. What should we do? As Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be baptized again, but after service, if you would like to remember your baptism, there's baptismal water here. So you can dip your finger in, make the sign of the cross, and remember that baptism and the meaning of it for you. And finally, we have communion and prayer. Who are we, the church, to be? Let us go forth this week and be the church Peter calls us to be, devoted to the apostles' teaching in Scripture, to fellowship with each other, to the breaking of bread with communion, and prayer at every opportunity. Go in peace this week.